Welcome to the workshop Gender in Research. The workshop is part of the Erasmus Summer School. And today we start with the lecture Conceptualization of Sex and Gender by Professor Sabine Utelt Prigione. She is at the University Medical Center of Radboud, Nijmegen. And she will tell us the latest scientific insights of sex and gender in healthcare research. After each lecture, we will have a short discussion with other scientists about the concepts. And I will later introduce our guests. Sabine, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and uh, welcome to the first of uh, four lectures I will, I will share with you. But we'll try to dive somewhat deeper into the concepts of sex and gender. We try to talk about operationalization. What does that mean for us? How do we reach implementation? And what does that mean for, for you working in teams? We will start now, first of all, with what sex and gender basically are and how we frame them in biomedical research at the moment. And at the end of the lecture, I'll give you some insights into possibilities for literature search and several resources that you can use throughout the summer school and possibly even thereafter. So we will start with a brief discussion of the conceptualization of sex. So what do we mean by it and how is it operationalized right now in, in uh, biomedical research? Then we will move on to the conceptualization of gender. And then, as I said, we will have a brief look at how you can do your own literature research and, uh, well, several resources that might be helpful throughout uh, the summer school and thereafter. Okay, when we talk about sex and gender in medicine, uh, we talk about two distinct concepts. And we'll start with the first one and its operationalization now, which is sex. There's basically three different options we have to conceptualize sex. And uh, the first one uh, is genetics. The second one are hormones or gonads, if you want. And the last one is looking at uh, external genitalia. So our assumption, and I will challenge this assumption right from the beginning, is that the world is pretty much separated in XX and XY individuals, the females being XX and the males being XY. And we have based that assumption on the fact that there are these two options. However, if you consider the literature and depending at which statistics you look at, uh, it turns out that not everybody is necessarily XX and XY. And although it is rare, we have several variations of uh, the XX and XY paradigms. We have X0 people, we have XXY, and we have multiples of the X chromosome, really. Unfortunately, we don't systematically test for this. So in, in people who have apparent phenotypes, we will know and we will find out because you will get tested. But there are definitely also several variations which we might never find out because we simply don't look. So the first and uh, if you want one of the more thorough steps to take is, is look at the genetics. The second step you can look at are hormones. So there are a variety of hormones you can measure and we, we used to simply call them sexual hormones and assuming that, you know, females have estrogens and males have androgens. And if you look at that from a somewhat broader perspective, uh, all bodies and all individuals, apart from some exceptions, if there are uh, different functions that don't produce any of those hormones, produce all of these hormones. They just produce them in different concentrations and at different times and at different degrees. So depending on what you want to do, you have different opportunities in what you can measure. So the hormones you can measure are, for example, the estrogens. And even there, you might have to make a choice. Do you want to measure the most bioactive one? Uh, so E2. Do you want to measure the most abundant one, E3 or estriol? You can measure progesterone. You can measure testosterone. You can measure metabolites or precursors of testosterone. And of course, you can also measure the sex hormone binding globulins, which are molecules that actually bind to these hormones. You have different opportunities. You can measure it in blood, you can measure it in saliva. And well, do you actually have to measure the hormones? Well, that depends a little bit on the research you're doing. You don't crucially have to do that in everybody taking part in your studies, but it does not only matter if you're studying the menstrual cycle. So for example, on the right here, you see... Um, 
the menstrual cycle in the first figure. And then underneath, you see uh, the activation patterns of helper T cells, so of immune cells. And what you can see here is that in a female cycling organism that's premenopausal, so that every month goes through a surge of estrogen and a surge of progesterone, you will see different activation patterns in the immune cells depending on what moment of the cycle that person is in. So even if you're not per se studying the cycle or if you're studying anything that's directly related to the cycle, it might be actually important information for completely uh, different things that are not directly related. So if you're studying, for example, the response of lymphocytes, depending on what phase of the cycle these lymphocytes have been extracted from the blood, you might see different responses in your experiments. So if that is a variable you need to know, you might want to control and actually measure hormones. The third option we have when it comes to the operationalization of sex is looking at external genitalia. And that's probably the way sex has been at birth has been defined in pretty much all of us. Because as I said before, the measurement of chromosomes, looking at a karyotype, and even the measurement of hormones is not routinely done. So this is the assignment of sex that happens in, in most people at birth. Uh, and in the cases where you have a relatively clear expression of the external genitalia, they can easily be allocated in the spectrum of masculine and feminine. This happens easily. However, there are a large form of variations of, for example, a large clitoris or a very small penis that cannot be directly allocated. And these will be allocated by most likely the physicians that see these children upon birth. So although this is not the norm, this is a broad spectrum that will be allocated in one group or another. These individuals will then, depending on uh, how their, their lives will evolve, either grow up and be perfectly fine with the sex assigned at birth, or they will at one point or another start potentially questioning this assignment. The group has been previously defined as intersex individuals, and in many activist cycles, we still use the word intersex, and in uh, the medical field, it was in the past defined as diseases of sex development. But now we prefer to talk about differences of sex development in taking into account the fact that these are variations of the norm and they don't necessarily reflect a pathology. The underlying conditions that can lead to these differences are multiple. And you see a little list here, but it can go uh, much longer. It can be much more extensive. So overall... There are three ways that you can use to, to define sex, genetics, hormones, and genitalia. The question, as I said before as well, how many of you really know their genetics and how many of you really know their hormonal levels at any given state, given also that they change over time? So when you work with a dichotomous concept of sex in biomedicine, we most commonly use in one way or another the least precise of all these measures. And it might be worthwhile to wonder if for your experiments, you might need some more information than that. Let's move on to gender. So which kind of gender concepts do we work with and how do we operationalize gender? We've had um, quite some difficulties in the past with the concept of gender because for a really long time uh, in the publication and in the work with gender overall, the terms of sex and gender have been widely conflated by scientists. Um, using gender because they didn't want to mention sex in their publications, um, using gender, talking about uh, cell experiments where gender wasn't really measured. So we've had quite some confusion in the past. Uh, however, in the last few years especially, we've been trying to come up with ways to frame the concept of gender in a way that works within the biomedical science methods. And the tricky part here is that really the concept of gender has originated in the social sciences and humanities, which have a different research tradition, have a different follow, a different research philosophy, and generally use different methods than biomedicine. And now we're trying to take a concept, which is constructivist in itself, and try to place that in a mostly a uh, positivist concept in medicine. So we're moving from a tradition where we assume that society shapes uh, our lives and shapes our beliefs and what we do. And we try to use that in medicine where we really try to find a direct cause-effect relationship in most of the experiments, which is quite tricky. 
So what we've been coming up in the last years is trying to split the concept of gender, at least in some of its parts. It's a, a multi-layered concept with many different levels. And we've, we're trying to separate that out in order to make it more definable or maybe somewhat easier to investigate with uh, um, questionnaires and with the methods we commonly use. So we can talk about at least four dimensions, but there's others you could add to this. But this is just to give you a general idea of, of what we're talking about. So the first layer we talk about is identity. So this is really how do I identify? Do I identify as a woman? Do I identify as a man, as a non-binary person, as queer, as none of these concepts, as something else? So what is my personal perception of myself as a person? And this can match the sex assigned at birth, but it can also be completely different. So sex assigned at birth per se does not define your gender identity. And most importantly, for the ones of you that work with people in the widest sense, so these could be patients, these can be clients, these can be people participating in your studies, the only way to really know the identity of your patients is actually ask them. So you will have to ask them what their identity is and how they would like to be addressed. The second step is looking at roles or norms. So um, what we basically try to frame here is how does society see you or which projections are being reflected onto you from the place and time where you find yourself. So in the Netherlands or in South Africa or in Singapore, at this moment in time, what does it mean to be a woman or a man or a non-binary person? What is expected of you? Which kind of attributes are projected onto you and what happens to you within that context. So it is really an interaction between the external expectation and uh, what society at large believes that your role should be. At the third level, if we really want to see it in basic terms, it's the interaction between the first two and somewhat beyond that. So we really see an interaction between your identity, you as a person, the roles that are being projected onto you from outside and from society at large, and how these two come together in relationships. So this can be at the personal level, this can be at the professional level, and this can be at the societal level at large. And which kind of effects does that have on your negotiation? So if you have, for example, to negotiate your salary, in which way does gender play a role here? If you have to negotiate with a partner, who stays at home when the kid is sick? Who goes out and has a career? If within society you need to negotiate um, your role in, in a broader sense, this all falls into the realm of gender relationships. The fourth level is the institutional gender. So institutional gender is um, foremost something that we use in organizational research, but of course it is also relevant beyond that. And institutional gender is really what are you expected to be or who are you expected to be filling certain roles within an organization. So um, as we were talking about roles within society, this is specifically in an institutional context. Who are you supposed to be if you are a CEO, if you are a professor? And what happens if you don't match those expectations? There are opportunities to measure all these different layers in different ways. And I'm just going to show you a few approaches here. And uh, later on, I'll show you some resources where you can find more of these. So when it comes to gender identity, the most commonly used and most widely used approach at the moment, especially in large questionnaires or in large cohort studies, is really the two-step approach, which allows you to collect information about sex assigned at birth and information about gender identity of the participants. So in the first question, you would be asking if somebody was assigned at birth female or male or intersex, or potentially give people to the opportunity to list anything else beyond that, or of course, give them the opportunity not to respond if they don't want to. And then you have a second layer where you will ask them what their current gender identity is. So do they identify as woman, as man, as non-binary, as gender queer? And of course, there again, you have an entire range of opportunities that you can give and most importantly in this field, give people the opportunity to define themselves, who they would like to identify, and of course, give them the opportunity not to respond if they don't want to. What you will do statistically then with your data is, of course, a relevant question. 
But overall, especially in this field, uh, it would be important to leave an open option, especially because the terminology and the field of definition of gender identity and queerness overall is changing over time. And depending on who your group is that you're working with, so are you working with 20 year olds or are you working with 70 year olds, you might find slightly different responses and possibly a much broader response uh, rate than um, you, you would find otherwise. So this is for gender identity, which allows you to collect both information actually on biological sex and gender identity. When it comes to gender roles, you will not uh, avoid the BEM sexual inventory, which is the most widely used um, questionnaire to, to investigate roles and, and gender norms. So at the time that Sandra BEM developed this questionnaire in the 1970s in Berkeley, uh, what she actually tried to do was challenge the notion of the time that masculinity and femininity were two extremes of one line. So you had one single line of sex expression at the time. They weren't talking about gender. Yet, so the concept of gender was still being developed. And at one end, you had masculinity. And at one end, you had femininity. And what Sandra Bam did, together with a few other colleagues, was actually challenge this concept and, and show the, uh, the possibility that there are actually two layers to this, so that every person can have a certain degree, express a certain degree of masculinity and a certain degree of femininity at the same time. So you can score both high on masculinity and femininity, of course, traditionally expressed with these questions, or you can score lower on both, or you can score high on one and on the other independently from the sex assigned at birth. So that was really the revolutionary step in the BAM sex role inventory. However, if you look at the questions themselves, what Sandra BAM did is she asked college students to define what typical attributes of femininity and masculinity were. And so you see that some very stereotypical and very traditional roles appear in this questionnaire. However, it has been used more than 100 times in biomedical research ever since, and we also work with it sometimes, and it does offer some opportunities for work. You just need to know what you're working with. So, of course, if this is used as the gold standard to define gender roles without critically reflecting what it does, it might not be very helpful. However, if you know what the opportunities of these questionnaires are and how to place them in a certain context, it might be quite valuable. And it has been widely used. Next to the BEM sex role inventory, which is designed for all gender identities, really, so anybody can fill that out. And, and the whole point is actually showing that there is no direct correlation between identity and masculinity and femininity per se. There's also scales that, for example, are only designed to measure either masculinity or femininity. So this uh, example is, for example, designed for masculinity. And what you will be asked here is in how far you score on typical attributes of masculinity and what happens if you don't score high on them. So how do you deal with the fact that you don't score really high on traditionally male roles? So there's a series of this. There's also some that score femininity. And, and what this really tries to point out is that there is a range of expression, but also that the fact of not conforming to some of these expectations can have psychological effects or it can have effects on your quality of life, for example. So depending on what you want to investigate in the context of gender roles and norms, you will have to pick an instrument that actually helps you investigate the specific thing you want to know. When it comes to gender relations, we don't have such a broad spectrum of things we can do. However, there are several opportunities, and most of them, especially in the private context, investigate in one way or another how the partition of uh, duties, of chores, of childcare in a relationship is allocated. What I would uh, like to point out for you here, and, and please keep that in mind, that when it comes to gender relations especially, there's a really high social desirability bias. So people have certain ideas of what they should be responding and might be responding accordingly. And you see that in this study, which compared the self-rated equality within relationships. So these are heterosexual relationships, but you can use the same questionnaire also for homosexual relationships for pretty much all kinds of partnerships. And then they compared that with the actual hours invested in chores and questions like who stays home if a kid is sick and, and so forth. 
And you can see from the colors and the height of the bars that there's quite a difference between the self-attributed uh, equality within a partnership and actually what the numbers look like. So if you want to investigate gender relations in one way or another, make sure that you possibly have at least two opportunities to triangulate the data because, as I said, there, there is a high expectation, especially in societies that think that they are egalitarian, to, to conform to certain norms. So keep that in mind when, if you want to study this. And in the last years, what, what came up are really more and more of these combined gender indices, which try to bring together several of the layers of the domains I just showed you and bring them into one instrument. So these have both positive and negative effects, I would say. The positive is definitely you have one instrument that tries to collect all kinds of different dimensions in one. So for clinicians especially, so this has been developed by Luis Pilote in Canada in the context of a large clinical cohort. For clinicians especially, it's one questionnaire and you just do that and you assume that then you know everything about gender. But um, of course, what, what gets lost a little bit is the nuance that I was describing before. If you get a result, and let's say here you would get a score from zero to 100, you get an 80, what do I do with that as a clinician? So what does that mean for me? And which of these domains is actually mostly related to scoring high on femininity and masculinity? And what does that mean for the next steps? So while these instruments are definitely a step forward, and I would really say we need to be very grateful for Luis Piloti to start this whole discussion again and actually pick up where we kind of stopped in developing methods, um, there are, of course, also things that need to be further developed, and maybe we also skipped a step in finding out which of the layers of gender are actually relevant to, to our healthcare practice and which ones are not. In any way, you will find the reference for, for this one as well in your materials, and you can have a look at it. There have been several variations of this, and there have been also other publications that go in this direction, so you will probably find a few of those that came out in the last few years. Regardless of the distinctions that I just made in trying to let you see how you can operationalize sex and gender separately in case you want to investigate one of the two, we should always be mindful of the fact that sex and gender interact throughout the life of human beings. And so even when you investigate cells in one way or another, you might want to have to consider that, although in that case, you could possibly just investigate sex. But if you deal with human beings as participants in your studies, you should be mindful of the fact that sex and gender do interact throughout the life course. And this is a publication by Laurie Heisel and colleagues that came out in uh, the gender edition of The Lancet two years ago. So in February 2019, The Lancet published a gender edition where basically all research that was published in that edition was covering all kinds of different facets of gender in the healthcare field. And she published this review where she really shows how throughout life course gender influences our access and potential inequalities in health. And you see on the left-hand side a baby with, uh, which will be defined based on their sex, defined by genes and gonads and hormones, and, and uh, um, which will then grow up in a gendered society. And as you see from the smallest unit of the home through the largest unit of uh, really a legal framework of a society you're working in or living in, uh, you see that all of these different dimensions have different layers that are all gendered and all of these will have an impact on this baby that is growing up. And then within society, depending in which societies you live, some of these might be stronger or some of these might have weaker power, but there is an interaction, of course, of gender with other dimensions, be it age, be it ability, be it racialized perceptions, and be it social possibilities and so forth. These interact with gender and come to develop a somewhat structured hierarchy of opportunities within society, which have an effect on your access to healthcare. So overall, this keeps interacting with your bodily development and with the sex at birth and will shape uh, at the end the development of disease and the opportunities for care. All right, let's move on to the practical parts before uh, we move on to the finish line. When it comes to literature search, uh, just a few points before, before you get started. 
So there is no specific algorithms in PubMed to look for sex-specific research or gender-specific research uh, that goes beyond looking for sex and gender in the title and abstract and so forth. So you will have to come up with your own search strengths. Um, most interestingly and curiously, in uh, PubMed, if you look for sex differences, the algorithm will automatically also look for gender differences. So in PubMed, actually, these two are equated, which on the one hand side shows that there is an awareness for point number three, that researchers still conflate the two terms. But on the other hand, it also makes it more difficult to possibly look for literature that only covers one or the other. Uh, and the last, field, last point, as I just said, it is an evolving field. As I said before, we are coming up with new methods, the methods are evolving, and so it is something that is dynamic, and uh, what you found 10 years ago might not reflect what you find today. Importantly, you need to be aware of what you're looking for. So PubMed offers a breadth of opportunities, and other search engines work in a similar way. However, it is important that you have a relatively clear idea of what you're looking for being mindful of the fact that sometimes the authors themselves conflate terminology and you might not directly find what you're looking for. Nevertheless, these are a few algorithm options that you can use. These are all papers that have not been uh, published with the intention to just publish an algorithm apart from one. Uh, however, they all publish their algorithms so you can decide which one might work for you. So if you look for uh, specifically for an algorithm for women's health, you can use Montgomery and Sharif. If you look one specifically for men's health, Stewart might be an opportunity. Uh, and then in Mormon, you have a relatively clear distinction in women and men and female and male. And the one we used at the time for the gender med DB is somewhat broader and covers um, a series of terms that go beyond just this dichotomy. But however, depending on what you're looking for, you, you might have to pick one or the other. And you see all the references here. Now, let's move on to resources, which will hopefully accompany you and be helpful for you throughout uh, the summer school. The first one I definitely would like to point out to you, and maybe you, you've used this before, or you've heard of this before, is, of course, the Gendered Innovation website, which was developed under the guidance of Londa Schiebinger initially at Stanford and then was supported by the EU Commission and Ineke Plikilinga came on board as well, and the two of them have basically been spearheading this project for the last 10 years. Um, we just did an update of all the methods that are included in, in this website, and there have been new case studies. So if you use it a year ago, it's not the same website that you see now. As I said, all methods have been updated. Some new methods have been added, and the layout is, is quite different. But what you will see here on the left-hand side, you find, as I said, methods, you will find terminology, you will find checklists for your research, you'll find a series of case studies that point out uh, opportunities to integrate sex and gender-sensitive research in different areas. Um, and yeah, so it really covers uh, a breadth uh, of, uh, of portions of science. And you see it's not only health and medicine, but really also several other domains. Important enough, there's a new section on intersectional approaches, which has wi been widely expanded. So if you're interested in that, and if you're trying to incorporate that, you'll also find methodology for intersectional approaches in the new version. This is the website of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. You see our colleague, Kara Tenenbaum, who will also give you a lecture in one of the, the coming um, days or months, depending on how this spread out. Um, the Institutes of Gender and Health have also a breadth of resources, and most importantly, have done a great job in bringing together a lot of the results that are coming out of the funded project. So you really see an array of opportunities to integrate and, and what you could possibly produce. If you don't know them yet, this is definitely something that might be helpful. Um, there are three online training modules that you can take with questionnaires at the end, which will give you a nice certificate that cover a lot of the basics um, that we have just discussed more in depth. So if you want, you can also uh, take these modules. And some graduate schools actually require their students to take these. The uh, Office on Women's uh, Health Research at the NIH has also recently updated their website. They've also developed new videos, which you should find under the Sex and Gender tab, uh, the second one on the top. And uh, there's also 
uh, breadth of resources. What you also find here, which might be quite interesting, is the development of the legislature that backs the request for incorporation of sex and gender uh, specific research in, in the NIH framework. So you'll find uh, historical development, which is quite interesting to see. Here are a few publications that uh, could be helpful depending on where you're starting from. So it's some basic research, some general reviews, some more clinical ones. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention for this first lecture. And uh, I'm very curious to hear your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sabina, for your lecture. And now a warm welcome to our new guests, Petra Verdonk. She is Associate Professor specialized in sex and gender at the inter and intersectionality in healthcare and education at the Amsterdam University Medical Center. And to Marijn van Wingerden. He is Assistant Professor at the Cognitive Sciences and Artificial Intelligence of the Tilburg uh, University. Marijn, you participated uh, in the first summer school of uh, uh, gender in, uh, in research. Did it change your conceptualization of your own research? Yes, it was an, it was an amazing experience. There was a, a fantastic group of international participants with very diverse backgrounds, and um, I was lucky to, uh, to be part of that experience. Um, the whole gender in, in research workshop uh, hit me like a freight train at maximum speed. There was so much information and uh, resources and knowledge being um, handed out to the participants that, uh, yeah, it, it had a great effect on, on how I think about research and going forward Can you forward give an well. example? Well, of course, my, my own um, uh, uh, traditional field where I work, used to work in is um, animal experimentation. I, I used to work in cognitive neuroscience and um, writing about my, um, my subjects, rats, um, I always try to be as general as possible. Um, where, uh, whereas uh, I now learned that I should definitely include the fact that I was only experimenting on male rats in the title of my, my research, for example. One of those little things that um, um, is a small change you can make, but it's very important. Yeah. What, nice. Petra, hit you when you uh, uh, had sex and gender in your research? What did it change your research? Um, I, th I started with studying women and work disability. So I plunged into the field immediately. I, st I studied uh, occupational health psychology. And I, at the time, women uh, were work disabled at a at at a higher rate than men. And there was a huge societal debate about this issue. And I thought that would be an interesting issue for my thesis. So I started studying that and that's when I ran into gender as a concept. Yeah. You, uh, Sabine mentioned also the methodology of intersectional approaches. Um, intersectionality is, is really a part of your, your, uh, your work. Yeah. How do you approach intersectionality? Um, well, I, I studied sex and gender for a long time, implementing that in medical education, implementing that in, in research, and then on the way, like moving forward in my research, I realized that this was problematic in a, in a sense. It's a step forward, but it's also problematic. Uh, and, the, and, and Sabine already pointed towards a, a couple of issues, actually, as she ran into uh, age, for instance, and changing hormone levels, for instance, which is already uh, an age and a, uh, an age and sex interaction. Um, and uh, as I come from gender studies in the gender uh, field, I have more knowledge on sex and gender issues. However, I learned doing my research that sex and gender is not the, always the most important issue, uh, not the one issue, uh, and that we always have to look at for, for which women and for which men is this knowledge true, in a sense. Mm. So, but how, how do you define that? Well, yes, you, 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 you can look at what they call subgroups. That, that would be that would be one way. There's lots of ways to, to study intersections. One way would be, okay, first define who is the most important to study 
this particular issue uh, uh, in. So, for instance, if we look at the COVID pandemic, one we, we had this discussion already from the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, does it affect men more than women? Exactly, for that was immediate. That was an immediate finding. Really, men would die uh, 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 more often from a COVID infection, and etiology would be more severe in men. Uh, however, there was also this age issue. We knew that also. Um, and the sex difference is highest in midlife. So this gives a clue for researchers or, sh or should give or, and should have given a clue for researchers to study them both at the same time and look at interaction effects. Okay. So look at different groups. Yeah, Sabine, if intersection is so important, uh, how do we integrate that in sex and gender from, from the start on? Because if I listen to Petra, we can't without it. Well, I think it's it's two it's two layers that come together, and I, and um, I would say I, I approach it from a very pragmatic point of view. So, um, if you bring in a social sciences background and you work with colleagues in the biomedical field that accept that or share that, it is not really an issue to discuss about intersectionality, and you you will also use methods that will allow you to do that. However. If you've come in um, from, I would say, a hardcore basic biomedical uh, approach, as as Maran was saying, well, a lot of times we don't even know if the rats are male or female. We don't report that. So I think it's really a question of where where are people at in their research? And so if, you know, realizing that the rats are female or male, and that we might have to report that is the step where they're at, then let's look at sex first. And then incrementally, we can incorporate these other factors. And it's also a question, of course, of methodology. If we have a really large uh, cohort, for example, in really large COVID trials, you can do these subgroup analysis. And if they are powered well enough, you can look at the effect of social disadvantage. You can look at migrational backgrounds. You will find, for example, in the United States that black women die more than white men. So this is actually reversed. But you mm. need to have, of course, the you population. You have to collect the data first. Of course. Yeah. But that's not always possible. If a lot of, you know, experiments in, in animals are done with maybe 10 or 20 animals. So, of course, subgroups are different. Also, a lot of first experimental uh, settings in medicine are done in small groups. So I think the point is really be aware of this and be aware of the fact that there might be these intersecting factors and possibly pick the right population, but yeah. also be mindful of what you can do and the limitation of the statistics you can do with that. And of course, who are you working with? And I think that's yeah. that's really finding a compromise between between yeah. those two. But yeah. you already said uh, that the train hit you. Uh, what do you do now with your research and rats uh, in, in comparison with hormones or genes or whatever? Well, I can say sort of trying to get on the train, basically, right, as it's coming by. So in, in my current work, uh, uh, which is on the is on data science and artificial intelligence, the, 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 the topic of intersectionality is, of course, also very important. Um, uh, Sabine was already mentioning that you need uh, to power your design uh, uh, sufficiently to make sure that the, the, the subgroups are covered in uh, enough detail. But that also hinges on how you define the subgroups. So for age, maybe it is quite straightforward. But as we've seen, uh, for gender, it's quite difficult. Mm -hmm. And maybe even for sex, uh, a dichotomization is even a simplification, right? Because there are other cases as well. So um, absorbing the knowledge about being cognizant about it and then trying to implement it in your, in your design up front, I think, is the way to go forward, especially also in machine learning and AI um, approaches. Because yeah. if you forget it, you will do it wrong, for sure. Yeah. Um, but what... what kind of tools do you need uh, to do it properly? Uh, I think, well, for, for tools, so there, there is a way that you can try to um, um, uh, mitigate bias, for example. So when we think about bias in machine learning or in artificial intelligence, we talk about bias against uh, minority groups, and be it uh, women or people of color. But um, we often see that the, 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 the intersection of both actually uh, has a disproportionate effect uh, that is larger than the two effects in isolation. So um, in terms of tools, what we need is a way to sort of visualize the problem and then find ways to mitigate the problem and be transparent about it, I think. Yeah. Transparency, is that 
yeah. a, a key word in, in, in your uh, research approach? I think that's a good word because I like the, the pragmatism that Sabine is uh, uh, promoting. We need to work with what we have. Sometimes you don't have the data. Um, so it's important that we start rethinking the way we do research. And I think for biomedical research, it's important that we introduce theory. That's, that's basically uh, what I would promote. Like start to think about these issues before you develop and design your project. So that's one thing. If you and there was in 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 the past a lack uh, of, of I think of so. That kind there of was no theory changing. about sex. There is no no theory about age because age is not that unproblematic itself. Like what what does it mean that number? Um, so, uh, are we of different ages when we're all fifty six or we're all twenty seven? So there's that question even for age. Uh, so the idea that you have to be transparent, I like that too, because you always have to discuss what you have done and why. Um, so we cannot continue with not reporting, for instance, the, 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 the sex of our lab rats. We just have to report on that. Yeah, we for, have medi for, for medicine for, research, it's yeah. very important. Yeah, Absolutely. So this is about transparency. What have we done and how did we do this? And what were our assumptions? And this requires reflexivity from researchers. Yeah. Uh, Sabine, you also mentioned the gender index. Uh, um, uh, do you work with a gender index, Petra? I do. Yes, and, I do. And what are your experiences with that? Um, my, my well, I, I have not worked with the one that Sabine is, uh, uh, has discussed in the, in the lecture. We used another one based on data that we had uh, in the Doetinchem cohort uh, uh, study. Um, and we it's actually a healthcare uh, cohort, isn't it? It's an epidemiology, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we we actually found interesting results, unexpected, um, which which tells me that there's something very interesting there. But still, we need to have a good theory. What are we doing? What are we looking for in the in the data? And you cannot you cannot um, find anything in the data that you did not put in. So this is based on, and very often this is how gender indices are used, based on existing uh, data. So what wasn't put in there, we will not be able to get out. So mm. we also need to develop new variables. Uh, and we still have to have a good theory of what it is that we're looking for. In But the isn't data. there a danger? You already mentioned that, that uh, gender indexes is conceptualized about the ideas we have nowadays in society. Is, isn't that a, a yeah. danger of your research? There's always a danger that we reproduce gender beliefs and gender ideas in, in our research. There's yeah. But then how to danger. avoid that? Well, um, I think it's a it's it's a it's a big issue. So uh, for for data science, we will say garbage in, garbage out, yeah. right? And uh, <laughs> I think this these old fashioned concepts are a little bit like uh, scientific garbage that we should get rid of. So I would like to point to uh, to a study by Nielsen et al. It was just published in 2021 on on gender related variables for health research. That's trying to sort of uh, approach this from a more of a, um, a factor model, if you will. So different dimensions um, that are not dichotomies, zeros or ones, mm -hmm. but have to capture a range of possible um, values, if you will. Because um, as data scientists are very, uh, very happy when you can capture something in a number, but that's of course very, very difficult here. And I think that um, um, we're going to see probably in the future uh, more um, curated data sets that do have a more inclusive view about what what gender uh, identity and expression can be in the range of that, basically. Yeah. But so far, it's um, you're hard pressed to find data sets that actually do include those variables. Yeah, is that a good idea? Oh no, absolutely. And I think one one approach that that's interesting that we're also trying to to pick up and see if that works. It's as I would say, uh, gender is always contextual. And so why not take that context into your analysis so that there is a methodology that has been developed well, not so long after the BSRI came out, which is called gender diagnosticity, where you basically, first of all, 
define the notions of gender based on the group you're studying, and then you use those for it. So basically, you have a certain group of people with certain ideas at a certain moment in a certain place, which will not work anywhere else, but you use that to kind of define your notions of gender. And then if you want to build an array of anything or measure anything, you can use that. So that's also an opportunity to, to take the time and space concept in, into account, which is really tricky to, to do. So that's point number one. And the other way is, of course, in my opinion, the, some of these indices have, have, we've jumped from looking at a bulk of things to having an index, and we have not really gone through the single steps. And, and as a physician, I would like to know, well, which of these variables can help me make the experience of the person that's sitting in front of me better. And maybe we need to split this up first and then decide what to put in such a gender index. That might also be an opportunity to um, think about what really goes in there. Yeah. I would like to add yeah, something Petra? there because um, this time and space, uh, the, the, these dimensions, adding them to your research actually challenge the universality of, mm -hmm. of research, which I like very much. Uh, everything that we find now is like valuable now, but may not be any more in 10 years or 20 years or, or 100 years. Um, and in biomedicine, this is, this is truly a revolution in a, in a, in a way uh, of, of how people look at research and look at, at the stability of knowledge. Yeah, okay. We are already uh, at the end of our uh, small quarter. So, Peter, do you have any suggestions like uh, Sabine had uh, for a literature which is uh, very handy uh, to use uh, when you put up your uh, research? I would, I would recommend um, students in this field to look at the work of uh, Ray Wynne Connell on masculinity. I think that's, that's uh, a theoretical step forward that might be interesting for people to look at. Okay, and Marijn, do you have uh, uh, another suggestion? Well, there is a lot of um, uh, interesting work in the machine learning community about machine translation, for example, but it's quite specific. So for a more general tip, I would say um, you can visit the uh, Zonenway website and look at their gender FAQ. It has a very concise um, first entry point into many of these, these topics. Okay. Thank you so much. And uh, we will start now with uh, the second lecture of uh, Sabine. And uh, she will g g discuss uh, gender in the research team.